Good morning, everybody. Um, my name's Amy and I'm the Communications he uh, Manager here at MorePay. Welcome to today's webinar. Um, the topic is absence management and bringing employees back from furlough leave. Before we start, um, there's just a few things I'd like to cover off. So we've got about 300 people um, registered for today's webinar. Um, with it being the end of the year and we're as approaching Christmas, I suspect we won't have um, full attendance, but um, we have muted everybody's microphones just to avoid any uh, background noise. Um, so just um, if, if you need to ask a question, you can use the, the GoToPanel box, which I'm just having troubles changing my slides here. Oh, there we go. Um, so yeah, you can see the panel there where you can drop any questions in. So if you're facing any technical issues, if it's, a, if it's at our end, I will do my best to, uh, to fix them. Hopefully there's no issues though. Um, there is a live Q&A at the end of the webinar as well. So our expert, Carl, will answer as many questions as he can. So you can drop your questions in as we go, um, or you can save it to the end, completely up to you, um, but use that question box um, and we'll, we'll get through them in the, in the Q&A at the end. This session is being recorded. Um, so if you can't take notes or you're multitasking um, or you need to finish up early, then that's absolutely fine. I'll share the recording with you either later today or first thing tomorrow. I'll do my best to do it today though. Um, I'll also share a copy of the, uh, the, the presentation slides as well. So you've got all of that to refer to. So the agenda for today, um, before uh, Carl takes us through absence management and returning furloughed employees, um, I just want to give a very brief overview of more pay. Um, I'm conscious that whilst we've got lots of more pay customers on the webinar today, we've also got a few people who don't know perhaps who we are. So I'll just go through a very brief intro. Um, I'll then uh, pass you over to our wonderful presenter, Carl. He'll take you through the body of the, uh, of the webinar. And as mentioned, we'll come to that Q&A at the end. Okie dokie. So uh, what do more pay do? Well, we make payroll and HR easy. We've been doing that for more than 50 years now, um, and we've got more than 10,000 customers across the UK, um, and we are still growing. We provide payroll and HR solutions. So that is uh, both payroll and HR software, as well as managed services. So companies can outsource their payroll to us, um, and they can also use um, our, our HR services as well, um, which includes a 24-7, 365 uh, advice line providing uh, support from our employment law consultants. So what we do um, is focus on four key things. So first of all, we are conscious that people find switching to a new provider quite stressful. And um, so we put a lot of time and effort into making um, the onboarding process as simple as possible. So we've got a dedicated implementation team um, and we have a simple switch guarantee as well. We also focus on easy to use software. So our product development team pride themselves on making our software as easy as possible to use. But at the same time, that software offers lots of rich functionality as well with as much automation as possible, um, lots of analytics, um, and of course, all the time keeping you compliant with the latest payroll and HR legislation, which this year there's been lots of. Um, Finally, we also have a team of incredibly dedicated experts and they offer a range of flexible services across payroll and HR. So that's enough about us. I'm going to introduce uh, your presenter for today, Carl Hardcastle. Carl is an employment law consultant. Um, he's got more than 20 years of experience in employee relations and Morpay are lucky enough to have had him working for us and with us um, for more than a decade now. Um, we are lucky to have Carl on the webinar as well today. It's been a very, very uh, busy year, I think in the HR advice line and in employment law. Um, and all the while, whilst working incredibly uh, hard, he's, he's still been getting a ridiculous amount of five-star trust pilot reviews uh, from our very happy customers who think he is fantastic. So um, it's really great to have him on the webinar today. Um, so I'm going to stop talking now and I'm going to hand you over to Carl who'll take you through today's topic, which is absence management and bringing employees back from furlough leave. Carl, take it away, my friend. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Amy. Um, good morning, everybody. Uh, good morning. I wish you a, a warm December welcome to our webinar. Um, just so you're aware, I did not write that last slide. Uh, that was nothing to do with me. Uh, I'm not a narcissist. Uh, that was all Amy's work, so thanks, Amy, but nothing to do with me. Right. Um, before we start, if I can just get over some main points, Amy's touched upon them. Today, I'm keen to be a two-way process. 
Yes, of course, uh, there's a little bit of death by PowerPoint this morning. We'll try and whiz through that. Um, but the copies uh, will be available afterwards. So you don't need to make slides. Or you don't need to do any kind of uh, any writing down. It'll all be available to you. The second point is we're keen for this to be a, a two way process. Yes, of course, I'm going to uh, go on for roughly 30, 40 minutes, uh, talk about absence management, talk about the F word, indeed, furlough. It's something that's been on everybody's lips since spring this year, uh, how you get staff back. But we're keen to be a two way process. If you're clients of ours, please use uh, the advice line because it's more detailed. Uh, because when I talk over webinars, it's kind of generic advice and, and anybody that's been in a tribunal, generic advice is probably not what you need, you need more detailed. But nevertheless, we can talk through uh, questions and answers, we can talk through generic stuff, but I am keen uh, that it's a two-way process, so please ask questions. Okay, right, moving on. If we can go to the next slide, which is absence management, what are the, de the definitions? Again, it's very word heavy, this presentation, uh, so it might be good for you to read rather than me read out. So I'm not going to read out, I'm going to talk around the situation. Uh, absence management is quite a wide thing. Uh, you're an SME, you're trying to run a business, uh, you'll un eventually hit periods where staff are not going to come in. And that could be a thousand and one reasons. Uh, the definitions is absence or attendance management is the development of application of policies and procedures designed to, use, uh, to reduce levels of absenteeism. And sickness absence, and there's a clear definition between the two there, can be defined more precisely as absence from work that is attributed to sickness. Okay, so there's people being absent, and there's been people being absent through sickness, and there's two clear, clear areas between them. Okay, let's move on to the next slide on some, uh, some tools. Okay, I'm gonna spend a little bit of time on this because I think it's important. Um, if you've got absence, uh, if you've got a high level of absence, then it's absolutely vital for a business that you've got the correct policy in place. The reason I'm saying that is if you have very scant policy in place, you have employees that wake up, think, oh, I'd rather not pull the duvet back, I'll just drop a text to my boss uh, saying, Soz can't come in, and that, that's the end of the issue then what you'll find is the temptation to pull the duvet back will be too much. So if you have a rigorous absence reporting procedure in place, then that makes it more difficult for casual absence. I'll come on to long-term absence shortly, but right now, the reporting procedure. Um, in your absence management policy, typically found in your handbook, and you do need one, every, every modern business should have one, uh, the reporting procedure. It will typically involve making a phone call to a line manager or to a manager or to the owner of the business. Simply sending a text, a WhatsApp message is not enough. Uh, it's there for two reasons. The first reason, as I've already touched upon, it's far too easy just to drop a text. The second one, and the most important one, is you as a business uh, owner or you as a HR manager, you need to find out exactly what's gone on. If somebody says, I'm sick, well, what does that mean? Have they broken their ankle playing football or have they had a dodgy curry last night? You trying to manage your absence, you need to work out uh, what's gone on. So contacting you uh, directly by voice so you can ask questions is, is the first thing. And again, we're not being nasty towards your staff. What we're simply doing is making them accountable. If you were genuinely ill, you call your boss, and say, I've been on the loo all night, sorry to be so graphic on this December morning, I've been on the loo all night, I can't come in, at least then uh, you know what's going on uh, and your boss knows what's going on. The second one is evidence. Now, clearly short service uh, absenteeism, we can't really provide evidence. What we can do is, I'll come on to shortly in the return to work process, but we need an evidence. So some, the first week an employee is absent, uh, they can self-cert, uh, which is effectively a way of saying they really can just say, I am ill. Uh, but once we get into the second week, i.e. after seven days, we need ironically called a fit note. Uh, don't please ask me about that. You may know it better as a, a sick note, but once we get back week number one, 
we need evidence from every single employee 100 percent of the time so there's no claims of discrimination that we've got a doctor's note to say they are unwell for work okay the third one is an authorized absence we people that wake up in the morning and think i'm going to go fix my brother's uh, gearbox rather than attend work uh, we need evidence in, the, uh, in the, the policy of what will happen. What are the consequences to follow the uh, uh, absence reporting procedure? And quite frankly, typically it is disciplinary. Again, it's evidence-based, so we'll have a look at the reasons. But if they just do not attend work, they do not follow your absence management policy, um, the outcome could be a disciplinary, and even in certain circumstances, could result in dismissal. If you have an employee that wakes up in the morning uh, and their attitude is, if I can't think anything better to do, I'll go to work, then maybe they're not the right employer, uh, employee for you. Uh, again, at the top of this webinar, I did mention about broad brush advice. Uh, if you're a client of ours, wonderful. Uh, if you have a persistent offender that doesn't follow your absence reporting or their absence is too high, give us a call, the insured advice line, if you do take the insurance with us, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. Um, I Last year, uh, I worked Christmas Day, and believe it or not, the, uh, I had a security company that had a disciplinary on Christmas Day. So whatever your question, please call us. Uh, if you're not a client of ours, um, Please be a client of ours, that's, that's, that's obvious, but if, even if you've no intention to be a client of ours, uh, if you have a high level of unauthorised absence, you should be dealing with it. You should be dealing with it with HR professionals, employment law professionals. Uh, getting it wrong can be expensive in tribunal. Okay, the return to work process. Moving on to the fourth blue tick there. Um, it is vital uh, that staff have a return to work process. If they can slip in and out of the business with no friction, then number one, you've no accountability. Number two, they have no incentive to turn up for work if there's something quote unquote better to do that day. So every single absence, even if it's for half an hour uh, at 4.30 on a Friday, I don't feel well, it's important that there's a return to work process. There's a formal, Interview is a strong word, but there's a formal meeting to say what happened, what went wrong, uh, how you're feeling, uh, have you seen a doctor. Again, what you're doing is getting information for the business, which can be vital if you're picking up management information. Have you got a health and safety problem that's making people ill? And also, it discourages casual absence, where somebody wakes up, it's frosty outside, my train's cancelled, uh, I can't be bothered to come in. So if there's a return to work process, a return to work meeting, then again, uh, it's important you have in your policy uh, a return to work process to integrate that person back into the business. Number one, to find out what's gotten wrong, but number two, to make the decision not to come into work uh, that little bit more difficult. Um, I've said it before and I will say it again, uh, it's keen that they got the emphasis to pull the duvet back. Okay, finally, before we just move on, uh, I'd like to point out that in your management policy, you should put pay down. Uh, people are wonderful people, uh, but they get confused quite easily about what sick pay they should be receiving. And in fairness, they do have a point. Um, in a COVID world, sick pay can be from day one, SSP. It can be from day three, if they've fallen off their motorbike. Uh, they can uh, have full pay. They can have a proportion of full pay and sick pay. So it's key that in your handbook, in your absence management, it clearly states uh, if they do go sick, what money they will be receiving. Uh, the last thing anybody needs in this day and age is an unexpected uh, wage slip. So that's, that, that's key. Okay, right. Again, I've spent quite a while on that time, quite a while of time on that slide. So we're going to quickly move on. Okay. Uh, Again, I have one eye on the clock, so I'm not going to spend too long on this, but common causes of, uh, of absenteeism, stress. Again, it's important to find out, is it stress because they're overdrawn at the bank or their football team have been relegated or has it got something to do with your business? Here at Morpay, we've seen a lot of turbulence this year where staff have been put under extreme pressure uh, to work from home. Uh, they live on their own, uh, but not more pay staff are here to add clients calling us about their staff. Uh, they live on their own, they've been working on their own, 
Uh, and for the last nine months, they've been sat in a flat, and that, believe me, brings a degree of stress. But common causes, you can see there. Okay, but the important bit of the slide is on the right hand side. Typically, absence is in three parts short term sickness, and we'll come on to that shortly and let me take you through that. Long term sickness, um, and that is less tricky to manage, but is more sensitive to manage because typically long term sickness will involve people with cancer, uh, heart attack, things like that. But I do want to go on in this webinar and talk about unauthorized absence, known in our trade, and I don't like, like using acronyms, uh, but it's AWOL, and I think that's a fairly common acronym. So we're going to look at short term, long term, and AWOL. Um, AWOL is typically people that just go off the radar, but more about that shortly. Okay, as I pointed out, long term sickness absence is usually defined as a period of continuous absence of more than four weeks. So if somebody has um, food poisoning, if somebody sprained their ankle, if somebody has earache, toothache, it'll last a few days, uh, it'll last a week, clusters kind of short term absence. But clearly, something that goes on for more than four weeks, more than a month, is something that you as HR professionals need to be addressing. And again, we'll come on to that. But there's three clear categories of absence long term, short term, and as I said previously, a one. So, okay, Amy, could we zip on to the next line, uh, slide, please? Okay, short term absence. Um, there's no nice way of putting this. If you have an employee with frequent short periods of absence, have a look at the, the, the calendar. How many are on a Monday and Friday? How many are on the day after a bank holiday? How many are on the day after their birthday? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. What you'll see and what we see many times is absences following a pattern. So either uh, your employee is run down and gets a lot of uh, calls, and I won't mention the COVID just yet, but uh, they'll get a lot of calls, uh, they'll get a lot of flu, they'll get a lot of football injuries. Have a look at how often they happen. If it's random, then that's possibly fair enough. If it follows a certain sequence, uh, then you may be calling kind of uh, foul on this one. Okay, the second bullet point there is you need to investigate the reasons why. If you've got short term absence and a lot of short term absence, what you may be wanting to do uh, is get their permission to write to their doctor, get him permission to send them to occupational health. If they have a health condition that they do not know about themselves but leaves them permanently run down, then as a business, you don't have a legal obligation, but you certainly got a moral obli obligation to look out for your staff. So if there's a lot of short-term absence uh, and they won't do it themselves, we need to help them to say is the underlying cause of that absenteeism. Again, I'm concerned that there's loads of words in this slide, which is why they're available uh, kind of uh, afterwards. Okay, and the third and most important point is and again, I'm being harsh on this webinar, and it's not really the Christmas spirit, but it's nice to give a webinar where I'm not talking about uh, Christmas parties. I think you were saying to Amy at the top of this webinar that you weren't, uh, weren't listening into. This is the first webinar I've done in December uh, where I've not talked about behaviour at Christmas parties, where Darren from accounts does or says something from uh, Sheila in warehouse that ends up in tribunal. Okay, but speaking of disciplinaries, speaking of the nasty side of HR, Depending on the circumstances, it may be appropriate for the employer to instigate either disciplinary, i.e. you're taking the mick, or the capability. Uh, you genuinely are ill, but we need somebody to fulfil the employment contract, and your health means that you're not that person. Some issues to look at with disability that I'll come on to later, but ultimately, either you can't or won't fulfil your employment contract, and as a business, you need to address it. Okay, thanks, Amy. I'll uh, let's let whiz on. Okay, long-term absence is, well, I'll be honest, it's, it's a situation you can never win. If you have an employee that's got some long-term health, uh, cancer, leukemia, heart problems, whatever, um, if you have loads of welfare meetings and occupational health and access to medical reports, then the employee may say, you're just interfering, you're bullying me, uh, you're not leaving me alone to get well. 
if you don't do that, uh, then all of a sudden as an employer, you don't care about me. Uh, you've left me out of the business to rot. You've not keep me up to date with what's going on with our clients, customers, staff. So you have to hit a, a very narrow point with long-term absence, welfare meetings, which typically are supportive, and in this day and age, probably all done over Zoom. Uh, if somebody's got long-term absences, you don't want to be meeting them face-to-face -face for their sake. Uh, good old Occy Health, occupational health. Um, the fourth point on the slide there of reasonable adjustments. If somebody has long-term health issues, uh, they may well be classed as disabled. Now, I realise that HR professionals will maybe sat there nodding. Uh, HR professionals will tell you that uh, in the event of somebody becomes long-term uh, absence, then they are classed as disabled. Uh, as, as business owners, you may find that quite perplexing, but employment law measures disability in a different way to your typical doctor. If you have long-term health issues, they will be classed as disabled and they will be covered by disability legislation and you are required by law to make reasonable adjustments. And before we have a thousand and one questions saying, well, what is reasonable? Well, a lot of lawyers have got very rich debating that point. If you have a small business uh, providing a stool for them to sit on at 50 pounds may not be reasonable. If you are a massive conglomerate, uh, spending £50,000 on a new staircase, uh, that may be reasonable. Uh, but again, any questions on that, we'll bring them either up at the end. If you're clients of ours, give us a call direct. Phase return to work. That is a double-edged sword. The only thing I'll say about that is make sure that there's an end date in, end date in style. Uh, if somebody says, I can come back three hours a day, then what you do is sit down and have a discussion. Um, say, well, okay, three hours this week a day, four hours next week, six hours the week after, and the week after that, you're back up to eight hours. The danger of phased returns is not phased. They're just a return to work on shorter duties. You have a business to run. You need to monitor and measure and get people back into the fold. The last one is the horrible one. It's a popular myth that if you have somebody off on long-term sick and that they are covered by disability discrimination, uh, then they are untouchable. Uh, they are not. Uh, don't get me wrong, they are treated with respect, with dignity, uh, with a soft landing, but ultimately, uh, after we've taken into account the disability issues, it is perfectly possible, and we do this here at Morpay, regretfully, uh, to help our clients on a regular basis, is dismiss people that are not coming back anytime soon. It's dangerous. Uh, if you do it with us, it, 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 well, it's insured, uh, so there's no risk to you. But again, if you're not a client of ours and wish to dismiss somebody uh, that is uh, off long term, that's covered by disability discrimination, uh, then please, if you're not confident, uh, get some professional help. Ideally off us, but of course, if you have said previously, if you don't want that, then get some other professional advice, please. Okay, Amy, let's, let's crack on. Okay, AWOL. Um, Again, I'm tempted to use the word COVID, I'm tempted to use the word furlough, but I will mess up the rest of my slides, so I'm not going to do that. Um, people disappear. Um, you have an absence management policy, people don't follow it, they just disappear into the ether. First of all, as an employer, it is your legal responsibility to try to make contact. Yes, I'm aware in your handbook it says employees make contact with us. Uh, that's correct, that's what we would like. But a tribunal would expect us to chase an employee. We don't have to chase them too hard. But what we do have to do is leave two or three messages, get back to me, set deadlines, uh, find out where they are. Um, but ultimately, if the employee fails to respond, uh, then we go down the disciplinary route. And it is perfectly possible, and we do it dozens of times a day at Morpe, we help uh, clients dismiss people even in their absence. If the danger of just leaving somebody AWOL and ignoring it is they come back in six months time and say, I'm feeling much better, I'd like six months worth of holiday pay now, please, and come back to work. If you can evidence that they have been dismissed, then you can evidence their, that their relationship with your business has now ceased. So if somebody goes off the radar, it doesn't mean to say that the problem's ended, it hasn't, it means to say the liability is still there. Um, you need to deal with it, 
and again potentially dismissed for gross misconduct in their absence if they don't engage in the procedure. Uh, that's not a nice thing to say, especially as we approach Christmas, uh, but just leaving people off the radar is not a safe option. Okay, Amy, I've prattled on uh, quite a long while. Let's, 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 uh, let's move on. Okay, we could only ignore it so long. Uh, furlough. What we're finding is a lot of employees, and there's no nice way to say this, uh, they've got rather used to living off 80% of their pay, uh, watching Netflix for a living. Uh, we've spoken to a lot of clients and they're saying, I'm struggling to get staff to come back to my business. And my business is opening up. Uh, my business has uh, gone through the second tier. Uh, parts of London are now going into uh, to lockdown again. Um, but ultimately, at some point, furlough will end. And how do we get staff back from furlough? And that is a big question. Okay, moving on. Getting staff back from furlough, we need to have a look at three tests. This is not a more pay thing. Uh, it's a CIPD, which is the HR governing body. I'm sure most of you know that. Uh, the government are still saying, and will still say for many months yet, homeworking if you can, okay? So number one, is it essential? If you've got office staff uh, that have been homeworking for the last nine months, is it essential that they come back into the office? If you have a pub, a restaurant, or a sausage factory, uh, your kind of frontline staff, uh, they can't work from home. So the first test is the government have said, is it essential? If the answer is yes, let's move on to number two. Is it sufficiently safe? Um, I'm certainly not health and safety. Here at Mopay, we've got some health and safety experts, so maybe they can answer the question better than I can. And again, if you're clients of ours, please use that facility for risk assessment and things like that. Um, just putting a jar of hand gel on the door and saying to staff, wear a mask, is, is not a sufficient risk assessment. You need to be providing a safe working environment. Um, moving on to the third point, uh, is it mutually agreed? I'll come on to that and I'll pick that up later on in the slides. But you just saying to staff, get yourself back here or else, is, is not an option or not a safe option. Of course, it's your business. You can do what you want. Um, but staff need to be aware that, number one, it's essential, it's safe, you've addressed any concerns that they've had, uh, you've listened to any underlying health conditions that they've got, have they got asthma, things like that. Once you meet those three tests, return them to the workplace. But again, look at the bottom three bullet points. Uh, I mentioned their risk assessments need to be completed, that your working environment is safe. Um, have a look at public transport. Uh, all over the United Kingdom, trains, buses, uh, okay, maybe not over the COVID period, but prior to that, it was all about being crammed on trains shoulder to shoulder. Uh, if they've got a car, it may be safe. If they're reliant on public transport, it may not be safe. And again, local wider outbreak continuing. We've seen London going to uh, the most serious tier uh, today. Uh, so if you're in the north of Scotland, it may be perfectly safe. Uh, for staff to return. If you're in kind of central London, Manchester, Liverpool, Leeds, it may not be safe. Okay, so just keep that in mind when you're looking to uh, step the office uh, back into uh, action or step the factory back into action. Okay, let's move on, please, Amy. Okay, I'm coming back to that word that I said before reasonable adjustments and reasonable. And again, a lot of lawyers have got very rich um, uh, quoting the word reasonable in court. Okay, so many businesses will have employees who refuse to turn to work. Yes, uh, we've seen that many times. We've seen phone calls to say, uh, our clients have said, I've asked Joe Bloggs to come back to work tomorrow, and they've said that they're in Spain until, uh, until next uh, January. So again, we've ways and means of sorting that out. Uh, but if you want staff to return back, what's reasonable and not reasonable are two different things, okay? Public health advice and the second bullet point may it's safe for employees to attend work, but the law is based on the employee's subjective perception. And those are three key words to take out of that bullet point. So just because public, in, uh, public England says something safe, uh, public Scotland or wherever, uh, you need to listen to your employee and you need to find out what their fears are. Because in tribunal, uh, the, the judge will not care about what the government say, 
when it comes to if leaves is safe, that will very much care about the employee, their health conditions and their situation. And again, the final bullet point, it is, and we have done it, if you dismiss an employee or put them at a detriment, it should be done very, very carefully. Personally, I have helped, and I'm not proud of this, but I've helped dismiss uh, many employees that have not come back to the workplace and remained uh, away from the workplace. I can't give you any personal circumstance, obviously, uh, but it's been done in a controlled uh, and a measured way that hopefully, fingers crossed, touch wood, that the courts will find acceptable. So if they just do not want to come back, if they've got so comfortable watching Netflix, it is perfectly acceptable to dismiss them if you follow a fair procedure. And again, uh, I keep saying this, but please seek professional advice. Uh, it can be very expensive in tribunal not to. Okay, let's go have a look at three tests. So Amy, if we could just kind of move on. Okay, right, there we go. Um, I've got a strong belief that when, once you start quoting law in a HR bulletin, you'll start to lose listeners uh, left, right and centre. So I'm not going to go into too much detail here because it's quite boring and chunky and wordy and law. Uh, that's what you pay us for. That's what you don't have to do yourself. Um, I mentioned previously on that last side, uh, slide that it's perfectly possible to dismiss, uh, dismiss staff that are not coming back to work. However, and there's always a however, isn't there? Um, if they have certain qualifying service, they will have rights against you for an unfair dismissal. Uh, back in the good old days, that used to cost your employee money. They had to go send a, a check off for several hundred, if not thousand, uh, thousands of pounds. Um, regretfully, that's been repealed. An employee can now take you to tribunal uh, free of charge. It can be done online. They can click send and all of a sudden you've got a five day hearing in, in court. Uh, so it's perfectly possible to dismiss somebody because of the virus and the disability and the AWOL and the furlough issues of them not returning, but it needs to be done safely. Um, so again, there is the law in front of you. If you're a nerd like I am, you might want to chuck that into Bali or Google or wherever and have a look at it. But don't let me come over as glib to say, yep, you can absolutely fire anybody you want. You don't. Uh, it, please take professional advice because unfair dismissal claims for detriments uh, because of the, uh, the virus uh, can be quite painful and uh, you as a business uh, costly. Um, one thing while I'm talking about costs at Tribunal, they are absolute. They are not means tested. So if you own a small business or if you're uh, Bill Gates at Microsoft, the award will be the same. Now, I'm aware that we're kind of hitting 30, 35 minutes. So let's, let's, let's move on, please. Okay, um, again, the second bullet point talks about law, and I don't particularly want to do that because, yeah, quite frankly, it's, it's boring, uh, and that's coming from somebody that's, that studied it. Um, you have a legal ob obligation to provide a safe working environment for your staff. Should you fail to do that, uh, they can bring, and they can bring a, a, a claim of unfair dismissal, okay? So if they are talking to you about a serious danger in the workplace and you say, shut up, we've got hand gel and I've asked you to wear a mask, uh, that, that does not get you home and dry. You need to provide a safe working environment. You may want to use health and safety professionals. You may want to use our health and safety professionals, but you will need to demonstrate to a court that your employees' fears are unfounded. If your employees' fears have any traction, uh, then you are in quote unquote serious danger as likewise they were at serious danger you demanding them back in. Okay, so let's go to the final slide. Okay, returning to the workplace. Um, this is the optimistic bit, and this is kind of the summary of my discussion this morning, because we're on 35 minutes, so I know Amy will, will beat me up if I go on forever. Um, but let's look at the three bullet points there on summary. Okay, good news, <sighs> you think. Uh, the COVID vaccine is ready. Okay, that's the good news. We've seen it in the press. We've seen it in the paper. The first injections have gone in. What we will see happening is a cascade down from the most vulnerable in society to the least vulnerable in society, uh, and they will be vaccinated. When's that complete? Uh, who knows? But when it is complete, we can put 2020, 2021 behind us, 
and all think it was a bad dream. So the vaccine is ready, but it's unclear about implementation. The best guess, and it is a guess, and don't let anybody tell you that they know this because they don't, it is a guess. It'll be rolled out and by spring, uh, it'll be in mass, uh, mass scale. Uh, so hopefully by summer, we all hop on jets and go sit round the pool in Lanzarote or wherever. Okay, second bullet point is please don't do your own thing. Um, if you follow government guidance, in the event you have a tribunal, uh, you can say we were following government guidance. Who are we as an SME uh, to go against government guidance? So that's the second takeaway. And if there's three takeaways from this webinar, uh, these are the three. OK, the third one before we go into the Q&A. Um, CIPD, which again is, is the governing body of HR professionals. Again, look at those last three words. Coming back to the workplace, is it essential? OK, and the government says homework in if not. Second one, is it safe? And I'm coming back to health and safety on that one. And third one, is it mutually agreed? Just because you feel that the government say, uh, North of Scotland's safe, doesn't mean to say an employee agrees with you. You have to explore and possibly even discount uh, their, uh, their fears. But essentially, you need to be ticking all these three boxes to bring staff back. Okay, that's 36 minutes. So. Um, We'll go into Q&A. Thanks, uh, thanks, Amy. Thanks, Carl. That was fantastic. As always, you made it very easy uh, to, to follow, nice and clear. So thank you for that. Um, just a quick one. So I think there was a point in the webinar where the audience view was kind of going in and out. Um, and so I'm, I'm really sorry if people had any issues with um, viewing the slides or hearing Carl. Um, I'm crossing my fingers and hoping that it won't have impacted the, web, the webinar recording. Um, so if there are bits that you um, you struggle to, to hear or see, um, you should be able to, to watch that back on the recording. And I will I will try and get that to you today. Um, I think what has also happened is that that's impacted people's ability to, to ask questions because um, the question panel is blank and I know for a fact that this topic um, is one that people have will have lots and lots of questions on so I think there has been an issue there um, and I can see there's a couple of raised hands but people haven't been able to drop questions in so it looks like there has been a bit of a problem um, with the GoToWebinar platform and um, so I'll obviously look into, into that and see what the issue was but that means that we can't do our live Q&A which I'm really sorry about because I know that's the bit that um, people find really useful and Carl is always so keen to do the live Q&A yes. that's your favorite bit isn't it Carl <laughs> it, it is indeed yeah it's the, the thing about the webinar is you talk for 35 minutes uh, and you're talking to effectively uh, silence uh, yeah. but once you get some feedback it feels more interactive and more friendly and warm but uh, if, if, if you if you if you have questions and you're yeah. our clients of ours uh, again the advice line ideally call us but if not uh, kind of email us um, alternatively if you're not a client of ours if uh, you want to make yourself known to aim it no doubt she'll pass your questions on yes in fact you know just as you said that one question seems to have have, have pushed through so Chelsea um, that seems to be this one seems to have worked so let's let's get this one answered um, so what can I do if a member of staff doesn't see a doctor but tells me it's a problem long term and she said that it's a it's a sinus related issue okay um, it depends what you can what you can do one of two things the first thing you can do is refer to either a company doctor or occupational health if she's not prepared to help herself then you could actually say to, I, I could, you know in that case then i will help you i will book you a, a private doctor's appointment and we'll get it sorted out the second thing you can do is go down the absence management um and that's typically disciplinary her saying i have a sinus problem and i can't attend work and i'm not prepared to see my gp that's her problem and not yours if she's not fulfilling her employment contract um then then we have to take action if an employment contract is pretty much like a contract you may have with your mobile phone provider. They agree to give you a handset. You agree to pay them £50 a month for 18 months. Um, if your phone didn't work three days out of every 10, uh, you'd be the first one down the shop to complain. And it's the same with an employment contract. You expect 100% attendance. If they have sinus problems, get it checked out. We will even help with that with a private medical or a private doctor or occupational health. 
But ultimately, if you reject all of that, uh, and as awful as it may sound, we may have the discipline, and in certain circumstances, that could even end up in your dismissal. So you need to mm -hmm. attend work more regularly. Thanks, Chelsea. Mm -hmm. And one more seems to have pushed through as well from Amanda. Um, so she says that she has a staff member on long term sickness, um, which is seven months now. Um, she's asking, what if they refuse to allow you to get medical reports or uh, and will not attend occupational health? Thanks, Amanda. That's a very good question. Um, it may result in their dismissal. Um, mm -hmm. If somebody's been long term absence and seven months typically is long term absence. They'll have run out of sick pay, I would imagine. You know, SSP stops at uh, six months, 26 weeks. Um, if they say it's my private medical data, you're not seeing it, then again, if you're a client of ours, it, it can be done fully insured. If you're not a client of ours, tread carefully. Um, but if you have to go through blind, you may even dismiss them. Uh, because they won't allow access to your medical history. If, if you can't understand the problem, you can't mitigate against it. It can be a dangerous thing to do, but it's perfectly possible. If they won't attend occupational health, if they refuse access, uh, access to medical, uh, and they won't, won't really engage with you, then you may have to dismiss. And that's all the questions that have pushed through. So I definitely think there has been um, a problem with the platform. So apologies again for that. Um, as Carl said, if you are a more paid customer, um, then just pick up the phone to the um, HR advice line and someone will be able to help you. Um, I can also point you um, in the direction of the More Pay Knowledge Centre. Um, so this is on the More Pay website. You can navigate to it from the, the, the menu bar on the home page. Um, it works a little bit like Google in the sense that there's a question box and you can either type in a question or just type in um, a topic that you're interested in and everything that we've got on that topic will, will appear. Um, so that's anything from blogs to guides um, to, to past webinar recordings. Um, you can also navigate um, the topics there and there's a whole list of others that you can have a browse through to see if there's, there's things that are helpful for you. Um, so obviously we, we've, we've got lots of things relating to, to furlough and the job retention scheme. So have a good look in there. Again, there's lots in there relating to absence. Um, so again, ap apologies for any uh, issues um, throughout the webinar. I am hoping that the, the recording will be fine and problem free. Um, so I'll get that to you today. Um, just want to say a very big thank you to Carl um, for being on the last webinar of the year and being fantastic as always. Thank you very much, Carl. Um, I'll Thanks. close the webinar now <laughs> and get the recording to you as soon as I can. Thanks, guys. Have a brilliant rest of your day.